Hi guys, today I've got on the podcast Alex Kekel. He's got a wealth of knowledge in terms of supplements and pharmaceutical compounds. You definitely won't need to speed up this podcast. Stay tuned to find out all the benefits for sleep for the peptides Ipramorelin and DSIP. Ipramorelin and DSIP? Yeah, so um, Ipramorelin is absolutely awesome. I feel like it's kind of, kind of poo-pooed on, right? Like At least in my circles, I feel like it gets poo-pooed on so much. Um, we are looking at this as being that growth hormone-based peptide that can do all the same things that exogenous growth hormone can do to a lesser extent. So to me, it makes the conversation simple of do you need extreme superphysiological action or do you not need that? Do you need a little bit lesser amount? Are you trying to be more of the longevity-based player, still right. lose some body fat, still build some muscle tissue, still drive um, oligodendrogenesis at night to recover neurological tissue? What are you trying to use it for? If you look at the negative feedback loop conversation of taking exogenous, so exogenous growth hormone is a 22 kilobutton variety. There's 20s on the market, but that's used for beating drug tests and it doesn't matter. I'm sure I've said that before. Um, either way, we're looking at that and what we see is everyone likes to go down the cascade of, oh, you have a shutdown of natural levels, right? right and that's right, why yeah. you don't want to take exogenous growth hormone. In reality, it's not shutdown, it's blunting. So we have a 22 kilobutton uh, and this is endogenous, 22 and a 20 kilodalton release. We then have a 17 and a 17.5 and a 5 kilodalton release. One will potentiate, one will actually put the brakes on and then restart the entire process. At the same time, there's all these oligomers, heterodimers, and homodimers, and different variations of these kilodalton varieties that do everything from healing, again, the gut to the brain, to soft tissue, articular cartilage, everything. It's driving everything. So that's endogenous. When we take the 22 kilodalton variety, which is exogenous growth hormone you buy from a pharmacy or wherever, it blunts that process, doesn't shut it down. It'll pull down on the 20. It'll pull down on the 17.5 and the 5. It'll pull down the, on the oligomers and homodimers and heterodimers. But that process restarts and recycles usually within a matter of hours. Not to a massive degree, but you're taking your bullets at night. By the morning, processes are already going on. If we shut down that entire process, and they've done this with a ton of cool studies over the year, right? They will have people be on growth hormone therapies for years on end, pull it off. And in the studies, which is not athletes, but general population, either sick individuals with HIV or um, uh, the short stature, people like that, within days, things are coming back online perfectly. and Things are not shut down or atrophied at all. So usually the whole shutting down process is not the argument that I like to go down. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I think Jay, Jay Campbell talks about that. I think he says that it's a bit, oh, it's cool. a bit, it's a, it's a bit exaggerated. He's saying he, he, he does it five days a week for years on end. And then he says, like, even when he does come off it, he monitors his levels and it, it actually, IGF-1 yeah. kicks back in pretty quick. Exactly. And it, so it goes back to what I said before about IGF-1 getting all the love and exposure. With growth hormone, the 22 and the 20 kilodalton varieties get all the love. But in reality, there's the underlying hundreds of growth hormones and growth factors. There's the other kill Dalton versions and the other forms, the postulated versions, the fractionated versions. There's so much out there we're still figuring out. Um, so all those things have a player. And that's why things don't just shut down. If things actually shut down, that's actually more damage related. And that's more of a dysfunctional sickness-based disorder. And that doesn't happen. So IPM, to me, the conversation is more how strong of action do I need? That's really it. Because the health really isn't there. Um, so to me, it's kind of, okay, are you trying to be the best bodybuilder in the world? Are you trying to go to the Olympics and start a drug test? Are you trying to just drive longevity? Are you weekend warrior just trying to lose some body fat? To me, either have their place and purpose. And I pay this right. really good couple hundred micrograms before bed can do a lot of good things. A lot of people- How much do you say? Uh, 200 micrograms, you said? Yeah, a couple hundred micrograms. You can yeah, go anywhere, yeah. you're like 100 micrograms all the way up to even a full milligram. You see pretty linear increases in overall beta oxidative rates uh, a good change in all the anabolic mTOR based cascades, the recovery benefits, like it just goes on and on. So I'm a big fan of IPM. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm curious to see. I have tried it before stacked with Sir Morlin, actually. And then um, yeah, it's a while ago now, I haven't done any kind of growth hormone peptides for a while. And then what I'm going to be doing is measuring my IGF-1 levels at the end of the month and then just seeing, because I've got a feeling they're quite low. I mean, I do, I take things like metformin, rapamycin, uh, my diet's quite strict so like um even at the moment i normally i do have meat but this because i've got a test coming up i thought i'm gonna just really cut down on methionine so i'm getting mTOR quite low but yep. then and then you think cascade wise like it, the igf one is probably going to be going quite low as well and then what i'm finding is um i can actually i've noticed when i was doing things like samoralin my central nervous system was calmer in the evening when i do that shot 
I had a deeper sleep and then because I got ADHD and I think like maybe like the cogs will stop when I if I wake up in the night for a pee then the cogs yeah. will start turning very very quickly yeah so I know he's been on some oil for a while that that actually I could unwind an evening like really really quickly the central nervous system was calmed down and I'd sleep better too so yeah it people say that anything growth hormone related for your biological clock it can be burning the candle a little bit at the other end but I think there's maybe like a kind of sweet spot where because obviously you've got that kind of growth hormone range you want to be in or IGF-1 if you're measuring that and so if you're just doing small increases to get if you're if I'm getting an extra hour of sleep a night if I'm not getting enough sleep then surely you know if I've got a little bit extra growth hormone but then I'm sleep getting more sleep and you think maybe it's it's for longevity wise if think well what, what's better is it more sleep or having a little bit extra growth hormone and that's you can argue it to the end of days and the other thing is because you have five amino one mq and by the way there's also that polyamine cascade driving uh the mTOR uh cascades as well as offshoot with igfs so your igf might not be as low as you think it is because the five amino one mq uh, just a little okay, off okay. Conversation. okay. Keep that in mind. okay. right because i'm watching like uh methionine pretty well all right, yeah, I'll keep that. I'll think about that. And then, like I said, I'm only doing a short cycle of the five amino, like um, like a month. So we'll see. Um, I think it'll probably tie in just when I finish it. And then D sip, like combining. That's why I'm curious to see doing it if I'm doing it more for sleep benefits, trying to get the right dose for that. And then with D sip, maybe I was thinking I have done it before. I didn't really monitor things. I'm going to monitor it a lot closer now, like my the quality of my deep sleep. And I mean, what what's your experience with D sip? DSIP is a tough one because it can be dosed the morning, it can be dosed midday, it can be dosed three hours before, it can be dosed right before bed, depending on your circadian patterns and how you actually respond to it. So it's actually extremely effective at driving sleep through actually a couple of different phases, physically, but it's pretty hard to actually dose it. I'm actually trying to get away from it because it's usually so much more laborious. It takes so much more time to say, okay, take it before bed, no results, I'll try it an hour beforehand, two hours, three hours, sometimes in the morning. A lot of people are finding more effects now I see with the actual morning doses. Because again, it's not the yeah. non-genomic, it's the genomic long-term effects. So yeah, you're not taking that's, 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 now that genomic player. Mm -hmm. Whereas you have something like an MK677 dosed at one to five milligrams. And that's going to drive REM sleep, deep sleep through a couple of different cascades, drive up oligodendrogenesis even more so. So I even have people do a rotation of a day of MK uh, with some extra magnesium ions depending on that binding. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, bring in the DSIP. So DSIP, long-term genomic player, yeah. MK, acute non-genomic player. And you yeah. can pair it too with whenever your days are going to be more busy. So the following day, like we had this podcast today, let's say you're doing podcasts all day, you had to make sure you had a good night's sleep last night. Because then MK last night, DSIP tonight. DSIP to recover long-term, MK to potentiate the recovery for today. So you do it a bunch of different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And because I understand, yeah, DSIP works, as you were just saying, works has a kind of longer lasting benefit. I mean... Yeah, doing it, that's what I've heard, like doing it like every other day, probably the best kind of protocol. And I'm not sure yeah. for not sure for cycle length. I'm, I'm, I don't know, like 60 days or something maybe. I don't know. But. You could have that in pretty long. Even if you had it in daily, that could be a longer term-based player depending on if you are, again, if there's a reason for your sleep-based problems, if you were just burning the candle at both ends like you, or are you someone who has narcolepsy? Are you trying to mm -hmm. replace different medications over there? There's been a lot of things over there where you can, like um, Selenc, I think people megadose Selenc to drive a lot of ADHD and ADD-based uh, issues. And again, mm -hmm. megadose one time or frequently throughout the week or every single day to replace other medications. Medications aren't bad, but it's more we're trying to get other benefits as well. So you do mm -hmm. it a bunch of different ways. And DSIP can be dosed while you're looking at like 100 micrograms all the way up to usually like 500 micrograms, 700 micrograms. It's usually like a pretty good sweet spot for most people. It mm -hmm. could be higher, but... What range of that dysfunction are you talking about here? Yeah. The entrepreneur at the lower end or the person with narcolepsy who's far end spectrum out of this conversation? Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. I think I'm trying to think what I did. I think it was 250 micrograms or somewhere in that middle ground, I think, last time. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds yeah. perfect. Yeah. You play with the kinetics, try sub Q, mm. try IM, try and figure out, okay, if you take it in the morning, because it is the long term player. But again, all drugs have non genomic acute effects. So can you be the person to take it and get a little bit more relaxed and calm? you know, right before bed? Or do you have to be the basic long-term genomic player? Always just take it in the morning for that mm. night's sleep or long-term Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing is like uh, doing it late. Yeah, because that's why I hear some people do it literally like 10 minutes before bed, DSIP, and then it's nice. 
knocks them out. Yeah. Yeah, no, they they think it's they they expect it to like work instantly, but it doesn't work like that. But um some people it does though. How like, dirty. A less amount of people. Yeah, I've had certain people take it and they tried in the morning because that's what they heard online, and they're at work like struggling to stay awake. That's not everyone. It's again the long-term oh, basic yeah. player, genomic player. Most people take it in the morning or a couple hours before bed, but certain people, the, the lower extent, like uh, the majority will be in the morning or again, a couple hours before bed, but there's some people you take it in like literally within five or 10 minutes. They just cleave, metabolize that drug so, so fast. Um, they get that epigenetic response even faster. And that's where, you know, signal transduction takes picoseconds to happen, less than a second. So right. it can't affect certain people that way. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think that's the pathway I really need to focus on is sleep. Like I say, if I'm really like working myself like, really hard then uh, if i'm trying to i'm doing something like the rejuvenation olympics which is um okay. i don't know if you've heard of that with, yeah with brian johnson and people and that and so like i've, I've got i'm doing i reverse my speed of aging 7.7 percent .7 in the space of four and a half months and so i'm due to do another test at the end of this month and i think that's basically that's an area i'm falling short of is sleep and then interestingly i tested my cognitive age um on this this, this app uh, called moodoo health and then uh, i did it like a year ago and then i was coming in like uh, 40 years old my uh my cognitive age and then i did it a couple of months ago like so nine months later and then it was uh i've reversed it by 10 years so like my, particularly my working memory and stuff had gone down and then at the time i'd basically been yeah i was looking at my restorative sleep and i'd increased that by like 50 minutes and yeah, nearly an hour nice and over that period of time, like uh, in the long, in the last six months leading up to that test, and I did something like paracet, not not paracet, phenyl paracetam at the same time, doing uridine as well. So I think a combination of a few different things, but the, definitely the sleep for sure. If my mem working memory went up and all this stuff, as you were saying earlier, like if you have poor night's sleep for you, it can really affect that working memory. But yeah, yeah. crazy ten years shave off my cognitive age just by pre predominantly sleep. I think I'm most excited to see where all this research and all of the biological aging and all of these metrics are going to be in five years. Mm -hmm. I thought 10 years, we're going to be completely in the stratosphere. I don't think anyone knows what's going to happen in 10 years with that specific research. Look in five years, because things are good now with those metrics, but the application is still a little bit behind. I feel like five years, it's going to mm -hmm. be pretty crazy where we can have some hard, fast numbers yeah. all the, now and everything they've been doing for the past decade. Yeah, and you think all these places like the True Diagnostics monitoring that well, uh, we're monitoring what people, the supplements people take. And then, oh, yeah. so yeah, it's so all that data that they're simulating together that you think like, yeah, if the amount of data, you, know, you say five years time, there'll be a lot more concrete evidence. Well, this this supplement does that, you know, this one has no effect. And yeah, there'll be so much more data out there.